to thank Dr. Rose for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. As you can see, my title of my talk is Defining Sjogren's Syndrome. And the theme here is that as we move forward in the age of biologic therapies for many of the rheumatic diseases, rheumatoid arthritis in particular, but now lupus, uh, we need to have a better handle on what we really should call Sjogren's syndrome, uh, particularly as we expose patients to potentially toxic therapies, but also potentially very beneficial therapies. And as you move forward to the clinical trials, we need a much better definition of Sjogren's syndrome. So that's my central theme. And I'm going to start by presenting a patient of mine um, who, when I first saw her, was 64 years old. She had noticed dryness of her mouth and eyes. She had been noticing vaginal dryness since the time of her menopause. She noticed, curiously, that she really wasn't making tears when she cried and, and did not sweat much, um, and then began in December of 2007 the painless swelling of parotid glands in a symmetric fashion. And she had a past medical history of autoimmune hepatitis. When I evaluated her, she had an absent salivary pool. There was this en enlargement, which you can see here in the photographs of her parotids um, and her submandibular glands. She had a large uh, liver. And the Schirmer's test, which I think you all know, is a measure of how much tear production there is in five minutes by wetting of a filter paper, and hers was virtually undetectable. Um, and also, when the ophthalmologist looked at her eyes with a slit lamp, and I'll show you that next on this slide, there's this very characteristic ocular surface staining. So I'll just spend a second to go over what is now done by the ophthalmologist as they examine patients with putative Sjogren's syndrome. Uh, there are two dyes that are now used. Many of you will remember rose Bengal, but that is very painful to patients with very dry eyes. And so we've switched now to using fluorescein, which stains the epithelial stroma of the cornea and reveals defects, which you can see here, these very punctate uh, defects in the in the uh, corneal epithelium, which denotes the sicca component of this disease. And lysamine green is primarily used to, pro to stain the conjunctiva. And again, it stains the devitalized epithelial cells. And you can see this again is punctate uh, lysamine green staining. And the ophthalmologist can grade this as to the number of dots uh, on the temporal and the nasal side of the conjunctiva or in the cornea and come up with a score above which a certain amount of such dots uh, constitutes a positive uh, test. Now, in this particular patient, her laboratory studies are shown here. She had leukopenia, or had a very high titer of antinuclear antibodies. She did have SSA antibodies, rheumatoid factor, polyclonal hypergammaglobulinemia, and interestingly, DNA antibodies, which many of you would think would be a specific finding for lupus. Um, but we see these uh, in patients with Sjogren's as well. She had a low level of C4 complement um, and also had the anti-smooth muscle antibodies, which uh, goes along with her autoimmune hepatitis. Now, she also underwent a salivary gland biopsy. This is just a picture to remind you of what that process is like. A small incision is made on the in inner aspect of the lip. The, the multiple uh, small labial glands are harvested, and then we can look at the histopathology. This is probably one of the few autoimmune diseases, I was thinking last night of others that would be an example, maybe good pastures, of which a biopsy, a pathologic examination, is a critical part of the diagnosis of an autoimmune disease and is done really at the time of initial presentation rather than uh, later as disease manifestations develop. And this is her particular biopsy. I'll show you two slides, but you can recognize that this is these particular minor salivary glands are primarily mucinous. Uh, later I'll show you parotid, which is primarily serous, but these are the mucinous acini, um, the intralo intralobular ducts. But what characteristic of patients with Sjogren's is these aggregates of lymphocytes that have aggregated around some of the smaller ducts. And if you look at this lower power figure, you can see at least several uh, such foci that have aggregated around the ducts. Um, and on higher power, you can see very nicely, at least uh, in here, the central collection of these very tightly aggregated lymphocytes around ducts. And they have to be adjacent to normal asini. If they're not adjacent to normal asini, I'll show you this later, we really shouldn't count these as lymphocytic foci. Uh, here would be another focus, which you could argue may not have quite the number of 50 cells that are required. And what the pathologist needs to do then is to count the number of these lymphocytic foci that are in a four millimeter square area of the gland. So the entire surface area of the gland section has to be measured. Number of foci have to be counted. And then you can divide and develop the focus score. And so it is a quantitative measure. And above one, one or higher, constitutes a positive finding for Sjogren's syndrome. But it's a relatively arbitrary cutoff. And we'll talk about that later as to whether uh, people who have foci less than one might still have the disease and so on. <clears throat> 
So I think all of you would agree on this definition of Sjogren's syndrome. It's a systemic autoimmune disease. At one time, it was thought to be a tissue-specific autoimmune disease. But it is systemic, and it's characterized by lymphocytic infiltration of the lacrimal and salivary glands, but also, very importantly, other exocrine glandular ductal structures, such as the sweat glands, as our patient had decreased sweating, uh, the bronchial tree, uh, the biliary tract, and the renal tubulars. Some patients will present with very classic renal tubular acidosis. Uh, there is a diminished volume, and I emphasize also an impaired quality of the tears and saliva. What we do know is that there is a poor correlation between the symptoms of dryness of the eyes and mouth and the actual objective measures of how much saliva and tears are made, and that has led to the concept that there may be a change in the quality of tears and saliva that also contribute very importantly to the symptoms. These patients, as our patient, have, have a variety of exoglandular manifestations. In her case, it was with hepatitis, but also going to be with renal disease, or lung disease. Um, and then there is this very striking, which I'll show you later, propensity for these patients to develop um, a risk of B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And as you all know as well, this Sjogren's syndrome may occur either alone, in which case we call it primary, or in the context of another well-defined uh, connective tissue, such as rheumatoid arth arthritis, uh, lupus, and so on. We're going to be talking primarily this morning about primary Sjogren's syndrome. So the features I think all of you recognize, it affects very strikingly uh, perimenopausal and postmenopausal women. The female to male ratio is, is well over 10 to 1, it often can reach as high as 20 to 1. Um, and then in contrast to other uh, common rheumatic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, this does not affect women in the reproductive age years. It affects them primarily after uh, as they reach menopause. I list this, which is what you will find in the textbooks. A number of epidemiologic studies have, have supported a prevalence of this disease as 0.5 percent, which would make it one of the more common uh, systemic autoimmune diseases. But I would actually believe that this number is too high. But actually, I do believe that Sjogren's is probably much less uh, prevalent than this number would suggest. Um, it is difficult to diagnose, and I will t spend time during this talk to try to highlight why we have difficulty diagnosing this disease correctly, I think. One of the reasons is that it really is one of the few diseases in our field where we need multiple specialists to be involved. We do need the ophthalmologist. We do need an oral surgeon. And we need a good pathologist to all be involved and in working together to arrive at the proper diagnosis. Extraglandular complications can occur in up to 50 percent. Um, there's this 5 percent lifetime risk of lymphoma. And at this point in time, we really would like to have a disease-modifying therapy. The one that has been tried so far is rituximab, um, but we really need better uh, therapies that would be beneficial, particularly for the uh, disease as it affects the, the lacrimal and the salivary glands. Now, the, the means by which we classify and I use the word classify importantly because I really don't want to say that these classification criteria are really for diagnosis, um, but in many ways they have been taken on that uh, utility. But originally in 1965, there was a seminal review in medicine in which Sjogren syndrome was simply defined as this triad here of having keratoconjunctivitis sicca defined classically as a low Schirmer's or the ocular staining, the xerostomia, which was not further defined as to how that was determined and an associated connective tissue disease. And if you had two out of these three, you were said to have a Sjogren's syndrome. And there were then at least eight or nine different iterations of different classification criteria from different countries. And the one I show here are the so-called American-European criteria that were last formulated in 2002. And as you can see, it's a lot more complicated, but some features remain, which is that there's an ocular component, an oral component, and very importantly, an evidence of an underlying autoimmune disorder. And you can fulfill these criteria for primary Sjogren's by having mandatorily having either SSA or SSB antibodies uh, or a focus score of one or higher in the labial gland biome. So these are absolutely mandatory that you have one of these two. But in addition, you need objective evidence of either the dry eyes or the dry mouth. Um, so often in clinical practice, that ends up being the ophthalmologist's determination that the patient has a true dry eye syndrome. Um, and then 50 percent of these uh, criteria that can be met by the symptoms. So symptoms of dry mouth, symptoms of dry eyes, an objective test to show that the patient has decreased salivary production or decreased tear production, and then mandatorily uh, either the SSA or SSB antibodies or this labial gland biopsy. Uh, 
And I must say, in clinical practice, it is very uncommon for the practicing physician to obtain a lip biopsy. So in many cases, it's really determined by the presence of these antibodies plus objective evidence of dry eyes. Now, we were very fortunate uh, in July of 2009 to open here at Johns Hopkins a Jerome L. Green Sjogren's Syndrome Center, and this was supported by a very generous philanthropic gift from the Jerome L. Green family, a research grants, and also the Bayview Medical Center. And our goals have been to provide patients with suspected or established Sjogren's Syndrome comprehensive and coordinated evaluation and treatment, um, and we also have a very important goal of facil facilitating research of Sjogren's Syndrome with careful characterization of the disease, collection of biospecimens, and clinical trials. And that's one of the reasons I stand here today to tell you about this and invite uh, collaborations. Uh, we are located at the Bayview campus, which is quickly, I hope, becoming an autoimmune disease campus of the Johns Hopkins University. These are the various uh, physicians and staff who are part of our uh, group. Um, Julius Birnbaum is our rheumatologist and neurologist. Thomas Graterbeck, Essenakbeck, has been the ophthalmologist. Gene Kim has done most of our lip biopsies. Very importantly, we have Ann Burke as our gynecologist. Um, and Tony Keyes has been our research coordinator. Now, I'm going to present data today from two different sources. Uh, one of them is from a cohort that I've assembled retrospectively, um, looking at patients that have been seen in the rheumatology division and in the Shogun Center between the year 2004 and the current time. And this cohort will include patients who with either suspected or established Sjogren's. And what you'll see here is that by looking through these patients, I've identified 256 who have Sjogren's by these new 2002 criteria. And there have been a wealth of labial gland biopsies done on this cohort. So 545 patients have had a labial gland biopsy, including close to 360 at Hopkins itself. So there's a wealth of material to study. And if you look at how our cohort, uh, the key characteristics of our cohort, and compare them to other large uh, centers where Sjogren's syndrome is studied in Athens and in Barcelona, you can see many similarities. Um, the, the average age in all of these centers is in the low 50s. Um, the predominance of women, which, is, which has been striking. Um, you can see that the Greeks do lip biopsies on everyone in their cohort, whereas we've only done them on uh, 121 of these patients. Uh, Anti-nuclear antibodies are uh, very common, but what's very important here is the frequency of SSA antibodies. So in my cohort at the Sjogren Center, I have 80% of the patients with Sjogren's having SSA antibodies, but very strikingly in the Greek cohort, only 37% have SSA antibodies. And that's a striking figure, which implies that as many as 60% of Sjogren's syndrome defined, these are primary Sjogren's patients defined by the 2002 criteria, are actually seronegative for SSA and SSB, implying that the only way to make the diagnosis in those patients would be with a lip biopsy. And then you can see as well the other characteristic features, and I'll show you in a minute, that these things often cluster. So there's also a rheumatoid factor, hypergammaglobinemia, monoclonal proteins, uh, low complements, and leukopenia. And as I showed you with the original patient I presented, some of these other autoantibodies can be seen, not frequently, but double-stranded DNA, centromere, uh, ribonuclear protein antibodies, and CCP antibodies are also seen, uh, not commonly, but in this cohort. Um, so it just illustrates that these are not necessarily specific antibodies for their specific rheumatic disease. Now, as I mentioned, there is this interesting clustering of serologic abnormalities. So if you look at this retrospective cohort, these are proportional Venn diagrams that look at, in this case, SSA antibodies, uh, SSB antibodies in this circle, and rheumatoid factor in this circle. And what you can see, of course, is that SSA antibodies in this cohort with patients with primary Sjogren's, about those who have it, about 50% will have SSA alone, 50% will have SSA plus SSB, um, but then rheumatoid factor travels very closely with the presence of SSA antibodies. Um, very few people have rheumatoid factor alone without SSA antibodies in this particular cohort. And if you do another proportional Venn diagram looking at now people who have either SSA or SSB in this red circle, SSA and SSB plus rheumatoid factor, and then finally SSA plus hypergammaglobulinemia plus rheumatoid factor, they're incredibly concentric, implying that these serologic abnormalities travel uh, together uh, in Sjogren's syndrome. Now, the second uh, data set that I will be 
sharing with you is from the International Sjogren's Syndrome Registry. We are part of that um, NIH-funded uh, registry. This is a funded registry from the NIDCR, which has been going on since 2003. It is based at UCSF with John Greenspan and Troy Daniels as the PIs. Um, but we have been fortunate to be invited to be part of this uh, study um, in 2010. Um, but there are nine global sites, including Japan and China and Copenhagen and the Uni United Kingdom, and India and San Francisco, Philadelphia, and finally at Hopkins itself. And the goal of this registry is to collect, store, and disseminate uniform clinical data and biospecimens for future studies of Sjogren's syndrome. And so I actually invite you to look at this website, and you can actually apply at this time uh, for tissue specimens um, and a limited data set to use in your experiments. So this is entirely the concept. This is owned by the government, and it, that means it's owned by you as well. Uh, the other major goal of this effort is to develop standardized classification criteria for Sjogren's syndrome. That paper is currently in, being worked on, but I may be able to show you some preliminary hints of where that is headed. Currently, the cohort includes 2,700 individuals who have possible early Sjogren's syndrome to well-established disease. The intent was to have fairly broad inclusion criteria. And importantly, 644 patients have undergone a repeat evaluation with a second lip biopsy two years after the baseline visit. And here at Hopkins, we've been doing this for a year and a half, and currently we've had 147 patients who have entered into this registry and as a result have had a complete evaluation for Sjogren's syndrome. So they have all the same protocol. They all get a lip biopsy. They get their labs done at the same place by Quest. Um, and so it's a very uniform data set as to how these uh, techniques and how the evaluation is done. So this is uh, from a paper published in 2009 looking at the first 1,156 participants in SICA. Uh, what you'll see here again, proportional Venn diagrams. And this includes 920 of the participants who have one of the three cardinal findings that you see in this slide. So these are patients who have ocular surface staining with a score of three or greater, which is considered um, positive or indicative of keratoconjunctivitis sicca, so it's the, the ocular component of Sjogren's. Another group having either SSA or SSB antibodies or both, and another group having focus scores of one or higher in their lip biopsies. And so there's several observations that one can make here. Um, first, there is this large proportion of people who have clearly dry eyes, keratoconjunctivitis sicca, who do not have the evidence, as shown here, for an autoimmune basis for this. They don't have SSA or SSB antibodies, and they have focus scores of less than one or have a lip biopsy. It's not indicative of Sjogren's. And so this is something that has been seen in the past, but it's reiterated here. And so, yes, there are a lot of people in the community who have idiopathic keratoconjunctivitis sicca without evidence that it's at least autoimmune in basis. Uh, we don't know for sure what might be driving this, but there will be some hints, I think, later on. Otherwise, what you can see here is that these, there is this concentric, a bit of concentric circles, and you begin to see that there is this conglomeration of people in this 325 group, which is a very useful working diagnosis for Sjogren's syndrome, so that the finding of two out of these three uh, seems to be a very work, good working diagnosis for Sjogren's syndrome, and that's the direction that we are headed in sicko is to define Sjogren's syndrome with purely objective measures rather than having symptoms being 50 percent, and saying that Sjogren's syndrome, at least by this working standard, with people who have two out of these three findings, so they have idiopathic, they have clear evidence of dry eyes, they have SSA or SSB antibodies, or they have a focus score of one, and two out of these three may be a very good tool for recognizing Sjogren's syndrome. And this has been extensively validated, and I really can't show you those data at this time, um, but I just wanted to tell you that that's where this is going. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the, the theme of my talk is that there really is an urgent need for clinical trials of potentially disease-modifying therapies, and we're really on the cusp of doing this. But the prerequisites really involve having good classification criteria with validated objective parameters and having a better understanding of the natural history of this disease. The difficulties that we have, and as a clinician seeing patients with Sjogren's syndrome, is that sicker symptoms by themselves are very common in the population. It's estimated that about 15 percent of the population report dry eyes, another 15 percent report dry mouth. So these are very common symptoms, and they correlate very poorly with objective measures. The other problem is that autoantibodies in Sjogren's syndrome lack sensitivity so that if 60 percent of patients can be SSA negative in Greece, 
that implies that the antibodies really lack sensitivity and they lack specificity, as you know, SSA and SSB are seen in lupus and other rheumatic diseases. Um, and the other problem is that the modern ELISA and other autoantibody assay techniques have a high false positive rate so that you may just find people who have these antibodies who really don't have an underlying autoimmune disease. And the other theme is that the labial gland histopathology is frequently misinterpreted. I'll show you in a minute why that is, but it requires both this quantitative and a qualitative assessment. <clears throat> so just to reiterate on the symptoms, uh, dry mouth and dry eyes are, constitute 50 percent of these requisite criteria, um, but in the SICA cohort it's been found that there's really been no association between the report of dryness of the mouth or the eyes with SSA or SSB antibodies, with the labial gland focus score more than one, or with the ocular surface staining. So symptoms have really not been very helpful in the diagnostic uh, diagnosis of Sjogren's. Um, in the population, and at, at large, dry mouth most frequently arises, particularly in the elderly population, as a drug effect. And dry eyes most commonly actually result from eyelid disease. Meibomian gland dysfunction stands out as probably the leading cause of dry eyes, where the oils that keep the uh, tear film intact uh, and prevent it from being evaporated or impaired, and there is more rapid evaporation of the tear film. In terms of the serologic markers of primary Sjogren's syndrome, in my cohorts, um, as both in the retrospective cohort and the SICA cohort, I found that 80 to 83 percent of the patients had SSA or SSB antibodies. And as you can see, that's not necessarily true in other cohorts. Um, one of the questions you could ask, though, is if someone lacks those antibodies, they lack SSA and SSB, do they have other autoantibodies that might help you define Sjogren's syndrome? Could you use a different autoantibody to define it? Um, and that's, I'll show you in the next slide, is really not the case, um, with the possible exception of CCP antibodies. And the other question then is if you get, often when you get these labs back, you can have someone with a very high titer of SSA or SSB, but you also get occasionally people who have a slightly elevated SSA of one or two, um, where greater than eight is a very strong positive. Um, often patients come and they've had in their outside physician's office a positive test, and when they've done it here at Hopkins, the test is negative. And the question is whether that's still a useful tool. Does that really point to Sjogren's syndrome, or is that just a false positive? So the question I'm asking here is whether Sjogren's does Sjogren's have alternative serologic markers in the absence of SSA or SSB antibodies looking at the retrospective cohort? Um, and what you can see here is that those patients who have SSA or SSB antibodies uh, are the ones who have high ANAs, are the ones who have high rheumatoid factor, hypergammaglobinemia, leukopenia. And the only one actually that stands out is perhaps being an exception, and I realize the p-value is only 0.08, are CCP antibodies. And if you look at these four patients, two of them had a polyarthritis that some people might classify as rheumatoid arthritis, so it may be a misnomer that these patients might actually have secondary Sjogren's syndrome. Another question which you could ask then, are these low titer findings of SSA or SSB antibodies meaningful? Um, and here I've taken now two groups. I've taken patients who have SSA or SSB antibodies that are positive, but less than the upper range of eight or higher. So these are what I would call weakly positive uh, patients, and these are patients in this group who have a very high titer of either SSA or SSB. None of these patients had high levels of either SSA or SSB, and as you can see here that there's a very strong correlation of those patients who have high titers, not surprisingly, with a positive lip biopsy, ocular surface staining, a high level of ANA, rheumatoid factor, and hypergammaglobinemia, um, but those patients who have these weekly positives um, are much less likely to have the cardinal findings of Sjogren's syndrome. And I took this one step further, which is to look at the correlation of anti-SSA and SSB status with the focus score on the lip biopsies. Um, just to define these three groups, these are patients, again, who have a very strongly positive test for SSA or SSB. Uh, these are patients in whom both tests were negative, and these are patients who had, I'm sorry, these are patients who had negative tests, and these are patients who had either only weakly positive reactivity. Um, and you can do see that there is a bit of a correlation. Uh, those patients who have very high titers tend to have the higher focus scores. Their median or mean is significantly higher than the mean for the other two groups. Um, but there are occasionally patients who lack SSA or SSB, not surprisingly, who have a positive uh, focus score on their lip biopsy. Uh, 
And then the last part of this issue of the diagnosis of Sjogren's was the issue of the histopathology. What we can tell you is that patients who have salivary hypofunction are being entered into the SICA cohort um, have variable minor salivary gland histopathology. I'll show you the range of pathology in a minute. Um, and I've already pointed out to you that the focal lymphocytic siloadenitis with high grades of inflammation, focus scores of more than one, is what we consider characteristic of Sjogren's. Um, but we really need to define what the natural history of this process is. Um, and sadly, misinterpretation of labial gland biopsies in the, in the community is very high. Many um, oral pathologists are not trained properly to read these, uh, primarily interested in whether it's cancer or not cancer. Um, and really don't provide useful information when they report on these biopsies. So if you look at the SICA cohort, and this has been published, um, this is the range of histopathology that has been seen in the 1,787 uh, participants at the time this paper was published. And what you can see is that 61 percent of these people who entered into the cohort, all of them having suspected or established Sjogren's, 61 percent had focal lymphocytic siloadenitis, not necessarily with all of them having focal scores of more than one is really, in this case, just the presence of some inflammatory cells in the interstitium of the gland, uh, but not enough to call it a focus. Um, and then 17 percent had a sclerosing chronic siloadenitis. And what you can see here is that there's a tremendous acinar loss, there's ductal dilatation, and there are these aggregates of lymphocytes which the, un the, uh, the, the novice might misinterpret as a focus. But since these aggregates are not near normal acinar, it really would not be counted as a normal, as a lymphocytic focus, and this should not be counted as a patient with focal lymphocytic siloadenitis. What's striking here is if you add up 61 plus 21 plus 17, you get close to 99 percent. So there was really only about 1 percent or less of patients who were said to have a truly normal uh, salivary gland uh, biopsy. So the basis by which the the focus score of one or higher has been used as the cutoff is shown in part here, and this has been a revalidation with the SICA cohort. Troy Daniels had done this years ago uh, with 684 patients of his, um, but this is a very nice demonstration of why we use this uh, one or higher as the cutoff. So here again are patients with focal lymphocytic siloadenitis with a focus score of one or higher. This is FLS with a focus score of less than one. And this is the patients with either nonspecific chronic inflammation or sclerosing chronic siloadenitis do not have a focus score. Um, and you can see the clinical correlates uh, here. Um, so there's a very strong correlation with focus scores of greater than one with the presence of the SSA or SSB antibodies, the presence of rheumatoid factor, the presence of ocular surface staining of a high degree, and high ANAs, hypergammaglobinemia. Um, and also with a low saliva production. But no correlation is shown here with dry mouth symptoms and a weak correlation with dry eye symptoms. So this is the basis for defining a focus score of one or higher as the cutoff. It's ar relatively arbitrary, and this is the only, uh, these are the data that are used to make these determinations. Now the other aspect that you could question is what happens over time in patients who have focal lymphocytic siloadenitis. Um, and this is where the pathologists have some difficulty. So here's a patient who has confluence of the lymphocytes in their gland, someone with Sjogren's syndrome, but this is, you can see that the, the parenchymal tissue, the acinar tissue has been replaced by confluent lymphocytes. The foci have become very confluent, um, and this is one example. But the other question is whether we should classify this patient as having a late stage of Sjogren's syndrome, where there is really tremendous acinar loss, a lot of ductal dilatation, fatty replacement, and no lymphocytes to be seen. And there is a pathologist here at Hopkins who has all along argued that these patients might have had Sjogren's, and now it's, quote, uh, burned out. So the latter patient here is really an example of sclerosing chronic siloadenitis, and what this particular example demonstrates to you is that you can have the characteristic features of sclerosing chronic siloadenitis right next to another gland that is entirely normal, um, pointing out that this may be a process that might arise from ductal obstruction rather than from some immunologic process. And again, here you see these lymphocytes which are not present next to normal asini and really do not count as a focus. Does this process progress? One of the questions that was addressed in the SICA cohort is to see to what extent the focus scores change over time. This is a patient of mine who had two lip biopsies five years apart. And as you can see grossly, just looking at the slides here in this room, that there really hasn't been uh, 
much change in a five-year period of time. And interestingly, her symptoms haven't changed either. So in the SICA cohort, they have looked at the patients at two-year interval, those who agreed to a second biopsy, and only two of 108 patients who were re-biopsied uh, showed any significant progression of their histopathology. Another finding is that periductal sclerosis was present in 24% of the specimens with focal lymphocytic cytolytinitis, and that finding was a feature of advancing age. Um, and this nonspecific and sclerosis and chronic cytolytinitis are also features of advancing age. So sclerosis and fibrosis of the gland can be a feature as, as one gets older uh, and may account, in fact, for the fact that we do see people who are older who have dry eyes and dry mouth, but really don't have an autoimmune basis for those clinical findings. So these are the data just to support this, which is that in the correlates of sclerosis and cytolytinitis, uh, you can see that as the patients if you look at people with focal lymphocytic cytolytinitis and those with FLS plus sclerosing findings, uh, the average age goes up significantly. Um, and as well, the patients who have sclerosing chronic cytolytinitis are also a significantly older uh, group of patients uh, than those without. These are data from uh, the NIH Sjogren Center, which really just illustrate that over periods of five years or longer, that if you do careful measurements of their saliva production, either stimulated or unstimulated, that there's really not much change over this five-year period uh, in their fairly large cohort of patients. So I think we can conclude from this that SICA manifestations for the majority of patients who have Sjogren's remains relatively stable over at least a period of five years or more. So the natural history is fairly benign, I think, for most patients with Sjogren's syndrome, um, but there are uh, exceptions. And so I present to you this 33-year-old woman who had symptoms of dry eyes and dry mouth since her teenage years. At age of 29, she began to develop painless swelling of her left parotid gland. This was resected uh, and showed a very characteristic histopathology of a malt lymphoma, which I'll show you in a minute. Her PET scan was negative. Uh, she didn't require any subsequent treatment, but then she came at age 33 for a rheumatologic evaluation at which time, interestingly, she had a very high titer of antinuclear antibodies, or SSA antibodies were also strongly positive, and she had rheumatoid factor. So this is actually her histopathology. Uh, this is from the parotid, mind you. Um, but what you can see here is this tremendous, dense uh, lymphocytic infiltrate that's clustered around the duct. There are follicles, um, and there's a remaining uh, preserved uh, parotid uh, serous acid or tissue here. Um, but in some areas, this uh, lymphocytic infiltration has uh, really taken over the lobule um, and showing tremendous uh, follicular hyperplasia. But very importantly, if you look closely at these follicles, you can see very characteristic myoepithelial islands, uh, which are shown here, which is really the intercalated ducts which have been infiltrated by these monocytoid B cells and have become disorganized, shown squamous metaplasia. And it's really these monocytoid uh, B cells that are surrounding this uh, ductal remnant which constitute, in this case, the malignant um, or monotypic uh, B cell. So Sjogren's syndrome stands out among all the connective tissue diseases as the one that has the strongest association with lymphoma. It is quite striking. Uh, these are data from the Sears registry, but you can look at psoriasis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, a celiac disease, lupus, multiple sclerosis, and finally Sjogren's, and you can see the 30-fold increased risk that these patients have to develop a lymphoma, most of them being marginal zone, low-grade uh, lymphomas, um, but also some having diffuse large B-cell uh, lymphoma as well. And this particular slide just show, illustrates the 10 patients who are in our retrospective cohort, constituting about 4% of the total who have lymphoma. And you can see that the malt lymphomas uh, constitute eight of these patients. Uh, a, Less well-characterized non-Hodgkin's lymphoma of the parotids was one patient, Hodgkin's was one patient. And fortunately, these patients were, have done well. Um, surgical excision was enough treatment for five. Uh, two got chemotherapy plus radiation. Two got rituximab either alone or with radiation, and one has been observed expectantly. Um, but they're all alive. Two were lost to follow-up, but um, uh, and one has had a recurrence. So as I, conclusions here, I think I've shown you today that the diagnosis of Sjogren's syndrome really should require a strong evidence for an autoimmune basis for the relatively common symptoms of dry eyes and dry mouth, which we found in the community. And obviously, that if you, in, if you interpret serologic and pathologic studies incorrectly, you will arrive at a misdiagnosis. 
And my concern is that these patients may be subjected to therapies which are inappropriate uh, for them. Um, so I think it's very important that we have an accurate diagnosis which to contemplate beginning disease-modifying therapies for these patients and do clinical trials. And we very much need to have better biomarkers to allow us to define the natural history of these patients and to really define which of the patients are at risk of developing lymphoma and which patients will have the more benign uh, course, which fortunately characterizes the majority. So I thank you for your attention and very happy to take questions. I yes. have a question that probably combines both of uh, the two presentations for this morning. Um, your slide showing the lymphocyte infiltrate were very interesting. And, uh, many, many years ago, uh, we did a collaborative study with Gary Masopoulos and Barbara Dieter, demonstrating that the ductal cells express HLA class 2, uh, HLA B other molecules on the surface. I'm wondering if, if we might have been missing also some dendritic cells that well, as you know, Harry Metsopoulos has been, continues to study this avidly um, and has made, his view is that this is an autoimmune epitheliitis, and yes, they do express, the ductal epithelial cells do express HLA-BR, dendritic cells do play an important role, and they've been characterized in these infiltrates as well. So I think you're absolutely right that that's a very important part of this in immunopathology. Yes? You mentioned rituximab. Uh, is that not disease modifying at all, or is that ongoing? I think that's an ongoing question. So if you, first of all, they have only been done for short periods. Um, the, the few trials that have been done have demonstrated if you carefully select patients in advance to have some preserved salivary function, that you can demonstrate improvement in their salivary flow at a six-month time point. Um, but the real question then is, do you have to sustain the rituximab therapy in these patients, or do you get a lasting effect? Um, so you're well, the point is well taken. Maybe I should be looser in my definition, but I think at this point, we don't have a robust therapy that has demonstrated lasting effect. Yes, Dr. Drake. Do they not respond to other treatments? For example, I'm sure that you have seen on television the advertisement with dry eyes treated with cyclosporin. Uh, does cyclosporin uh, systemically help these people? And what about the ones who have the rheumatoid features? Do they respond to the usual uh, rheumatoid treatments? So those are very good questions. So the topical cyclosporin probably does not affect the lacrimal gland, but it affects the ocular surface where there can be inflammation which contributes to the dry eye syndrome. Uh, systemic cyclosporin has not been a success in Sjogren's syndrome. If you take people who have rheumatoid arthritis, um, yes, yeah, some of them have received rituximab, and then fortunately their Sjogren's may improve modestly. Um, classically, that would be a patient with fairly advanced rheumatoid arthritis who develops uh, Sjogren's. But I've also encountered, as I hinted at an earlier slide, that some of these patients with rheumatoid arthritis can develop after the Sjogren's um, and it gives us more justification to use rituximab, um, and there may be some benefit. So yes, I'm hoping that some of those therapies will provide two purposes. All right. No, later. <laughs> Barbara. Okay, considering uh, you know, this uh, dry eyes and uh, dry mouth uh, it seems now, which is uh, generated by, you know, usage of uh, relax. Uh, do you see, you know, similar pathology uh, in these patients uh, where, you know, the symptoms are drug-induced compared to patients with real, you know, root or uh, autoimmune base of, uh, of the disease? That's a very important question. I think that has, we have the opportunity to look at that because in the sicker cohort, there's been a careful delineation of what medications people have been on, um, and obviously you have the focus scores. Um, I think what you will find is that with people's advancing age, they will get more sclerosis of the gland, loss of acne, um, which is not a necessarily an autoimmune process. Um, what I find interesting, and, and Dr. Shakova may be able to say something about this, is that some of the animal models, you can have a viral infection that will wipe out the gland, 
that can be a model of Sjogren's syndrome, but you wonder if, in fact, some of this destruction of the gland could be a viral infection that has come and gone and left in its wake a destroyed gland of someone with very dry eyes and dry mouth. We haven't had examples of that in man, um, but apparently it can be seen in animal models. I don't know if you want to comment. Or... All right, let's take okay. a break. Thank you very much. We can come back up together. Okay, so we have like 10 minutes. Well, thank you.